Welcome to another episode of the Hospitality Mentor Podcast, and today I am very excited for this one. I've got Lance Sanson, the Vice President of Campus Dining at John Knox Village. Lance, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Steve Turk. Thank you for having me. Well, Lance, we got to catch up recently, and it was a great conversation. I was like, man, this guy's made for the podcast with so many great stories. But we always start the same way. What was your first job in hospitality? So when I was 15, I went to my dad and said, Dad, can I get $5 to get a slice of pizza after the football game on Friday night? He said, if, if you want to get a slice of pizza and $5, you need to get a job. So I went to the school counselor. They told me I need a tie and a shirt. And I looked in, back then in the newspaper, the register guard, and I found a job opportunity for a fine dining restaurant. So I applied. I went and Mo Afshar, who was one of the owners of the Chantrell, um, one of his things he would do was put a crumpled piece of paper out, out front of the, the door. And if you didn't pick up that piece of paper, no matter what your skill set was, you didn't have a chance at getting a job. Wow. So I picked it up, thankfully. Um, I was hired. Um, and so I was hired to be a bus boy at the restaurant. Uh, and this was a, an amazing restaurant, the best perhaps in the state of Oregon at the time, definitely the best in Eugene, Oregon. So I got to learn under his tutelage. And so Mo Afshar was a previous uh, maitre d' at the Beverly Hills Hotel when it was at its prime in the 70s. And then he moved to Oregon, uh, worked at a restaurant called Harry's on the Canal, and then opened up Chantrelle's with Chef Rolf Schmidt. Wow. So I got to go to work with both of them. Um, they they liked to have fun with me because I was young. So one time I had a cold, and so they said, Chef uh, Rolf said, Lance, come here, put your head in this. So he, he put my head in a five-gallon bucket of horseradish. He says, breathe in through your nose, and I did. My nose was clear for about 20 seconds, but it burned. Um, wow, so you mentioned you're 15 years old, right, working in, in your hometown. Was that the first job you ever had? Because it's I can only imagine myself 15 walking into a place like this, you know, working with all these adults. Was it eye-opening, or was it something you were used to? Yeah, no, I mean, it was it was kind of, in a way, eye-opening. You know, as a younger kid, you, know, you collect bottles, cans, deliver newspapers, pick fruit, berries, whatever it may be. Um, but this was my first official job, right, where you're paying taxes and so forth and going to work uh, in a building where everybody else is an adult, except for you, for the most part. Right. And so you're doing this. Is it something that you enjoy doing? While you were there, was it just, oh, I just want to get my money so I can do what I want to do. No, I had a lot of fun. You know, growing up as a kid, I was competitive, played sports. So whatever it was I did, I wanted to be the best. Um, so when I went to work with him, it was learning how to be the best. So learning how to be present, but not seen. So back those days, of course, there was smoking. So you had to cap every ashtray constantly. Uh, if somebody took a drink out of their water glass, you had to refill it You know, before their next sip of water. So there was a lot of stress, but also there was a lot of money to be had. And so I was back then, and if you if you go back into the middle 80s, I was making about $100 a night in tips. Wow. That was a lot of money. So for me, I was making more than a school teacher. So the downside to that, it was, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to college. I, I'm making enough money now, right? So I had to get checked, if you will, and, and know that there's more than just going and being a busboy. But it was a great experience learning under both of them. And in every job throughout my career, I always ask, can I spend at least one day in the kitchen? Uh, my passion was the food. My skill set and the money was out front. Yep. Um, so when I say skill set, you know, I was very good at everything I did with people. But in the kitchen, there's knife skills. You got to remember that the plate's hot coming out of the oven, right? So my fingers cannot handle a hot plate because I burned them enough times on accident. Me too. <laughs> it's true. And so when you're doing this in high school, you know, all right, it's a great job you had. You end up deciding that you want to go to college to do something else, or is that oh, my passion is hospitality? What do you end up going? It stayed passion of hospitality. I went to college, um, University of Oregon, um, it, but just to go to school, not really having an idea um, of what I was going to do, what was going to come of it. Um, so then I did venture back into uh, the restaurant industry, didn't finish college, um, yeah. and then ended up moving duck. to Vail, Colorado. What? I am a duck still, but okay. not a graduated duck. Um, 
So it, yeah, so my career then co continued in the restaurant industry. So why why you end up moving to Vail? Was it was your family supportive or were they not? Like because that's a tough choice for a lot of people when they're in school and they're not sure what they want to do. How was your family about it? Uh, they were always supportive of whatever I did. If if I found joy and happiness in it, then that was fine. You know, with my father, he was an enlisted military man, so it was anything but the military for him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my mom, she always just you know wanted me to be happy and prayed, and it's just as long as you're safe. Uh, but I. It was another one of those decisions. I don't know that it was guided correctly, but I'm thankful that it happened. I moved to Vail, Colorado with a girlfriend that was born and raised in Vail, and she wanted to move back to Vail. So I said, okay, let's go. And so we moved to Vail together. Very nice. And so you moved for love into Vail. And this is when you start working at the Pepsi's restaurant and bar in the Vail Village? Pepe's, yep. Pepe's. Pepe's. So Pepe, Pepe Gromsheimer uh, was one of the founders of Vail, Colorado. So he has a, uh, God rest his soul, he's gone. Um, he has a restaurant on Bridge Street uh, that also has a ski shop and a hotel all together in one. It's right in the center of Vail. Um, so to work there, uh, one, it's a prestigious place, well-known, a lot of history. Um, but then uh, for myself, it was another great learning opportunity. So there I started working in the Austrian side, the Austrian room. And there as a bus boy and then as a waiter and then got to move to the wild game room on the other side of the restaurant where there was more table side cookery. Uh, but it took me a few years in order to move up to that, to learn more about wines from the sommelier there at Pepe's. Um, just a, another great experience. Um, so I, I enjoyed that one as well. And again, with the chef there, uh, Chef Peter Frankie, God rest his soul. He brought me in the kitchen. And if you know anything about the uh, Austrians or Germans, they work hard and they play hard. They mm -hmm. may yell at you during service, but then they'll sit down and have a beer with you afterwards and hug you and kiss you. Um, so now the great hospitality environment where I got to work in the kitchen and in the dining room. So what's that like? You're in your young 20s, right? You just left Early school. 20s. You're with yep. your girlfriend. Did that last? No. Uh, that's usually how it goes. That's a whole nother story. But yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> We we broke up on the way there, uh, a whole nother whole nother discussion. Uh, so my first three nights there, I was uh, sleeping in my car in the parking garage in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in the middle of winter. So Pepe's really kind of came in and saved you. Yeah, I got a job, job at the on the mountain uh, in the ski school as a ski instructor. So I was able to get into the the ski lodge early and warm up. But then I quickly got a place to stay, and and then from then on, it was paradise. So when you're doing this and you're working, because you're working hard, this is not, you're really in the support staff. You're not the server yet. You're not the bartender. You're not a manager yet. What were you thinking that whole time? Was this, all right, I'm going to make a career out of this. I'm going to learn as much as I can and become a sommelier. What was your mindset at that young age? Continued to go in the trajectory I was going, continued to learn, continued to elevate. I don't know that I was career minded as much, but I wanted to continue to be the best and learn from the best. So I had had an opportunity in the first job to learn from a maitre d' of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Now I'm in Vail, Colorado, prestigious ski town in the country and in the world, able to learn again from some great hospitality people. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just, for the most part, as a young kid going day to day, enjoying life, getting on the mountain skiing. I don't want to say a ski bum, but kind of, you know, and in the summertime, it was on the mountain bike and, and doing that and just having fun, but in an environment that I enjoyed and where I actually made good money. Yep. And so you end up making a couple of changes in your career. How did you decide that, all right, I'm going to start growing into some leadership roles? When does that start happening? So when I'm 29 years old, I just so happened to go back to Eugene, Oregon, and I am visiting old friends. I went to see the lady, Anita, that cut my hair since I was nine. Stopped by and she says, oh, have you seen Michael, her son? I said, no, I haven't. Here's his number. So I reached out to him. And let him know that at, my goal was now at the age of 30 to go into management. No more bartending, no more waiting tables. It's career-minded time. Mm -hmm. And he said, Lance, he goes, well, actually, I, I know the owner of a company, Bill Anton. Um, he's looking for a general manager for the D.C. Air, airport. And I said, okay. So I sent my resume. I flew out for an interview, met with George McDonald, the chief operating officer. I was hired, and then I commuted out from there out to uh, Northern Virginia, 
um, and then started my career in management at that point. And it just so happened wow. that I started the weekend before I turned 30. So God was good that uh, when I turned 30, my goal was met. So that's interesting because to become a manager now, people are like, where did you manage before? Let me see where you were doing. And you kind of just mentioned you hadn't had that. So were you just really good at interviewing? Was it your passion? They say, all right, we'll give you a shot, kid. Let's see what you got here. How did that go? I was surprised. You know, I, I had, you know, I've always looked young for my age. And so I was always kind of passed over. Um, I'd always wanted to go to management. I was always a, a star trainer at different restaurants. I always had those roles, but never got my foot in the door as a manager. So when I interviewed for this, I, you know, kind of cheek and tongue, I said, all right, I'll fly out for the interview. You're paying for it. Why not? I'll see the nation's capital. And then several conversations with the chief operating officer. Now, this role um, that started in 1997, it paid me $25,000 a year. And I got to 10 bars. So it was like a bartender manager of the restaurant there in okay. the airport. And but then George, who became my next mentor, says, Lance, you need to dress for the job you want, not for the one you have. And he didn't necessarily mean physical dress, but you need to be top of mind when somebody's looking for their next X, Y and Z leader. So I just immediately stopped tending bar. I gave the bartender shifts away. I started wearing a jacket and a tie, started managing the restaurant, drove revenue, you know, my in my first time there, I was looking at the coffee shop across the hall that had a line of people. And I was like, well, we've got coffee. Why aren't they coming to us? You know, we've got breakfast, sit down and eat it. So I said, OK. So I went down, I bought um, a couple of tables. I got some chafing dishes and I created an all you can eat buffet. So at 430 in the morning before that line could start, I was out in the hallway with my chef hat on chef coat. All you can eat buffet, 495 fresh eggs, bacon and naming off everything. Pretty soon everybody's coming in. It's like, all you got to do is just come in, help yourself, sit down, and your server will take care of you from there. So people were able to get in, get a hot breakfast for less than $5. So then we drove revenue from a couple hundred to over 1500 every day for breakfast. Drove revenue all day long. Just took that restaurant perspective of we need to get people in the door. The owner of the company, because our corporate office at the time was there at National Airport, saw what we were doing. So within three months, they had me opening up restaurants in uh, Long Island and then down in North Carolina and then opening up several restaurants in JFK over about two and a half years. I lived in a hotel at the JFK airport. Wow. Um, so it just grew fast, it, it, basically by putting my foot forward to saying, you know what, I want more. I like this. I'm not going to settle for this um, and just really just gave it everything I had and was recognized for it to eventually become the regional manager of the largest portfolio in the company. That's amazing. All because you had this little entrepreneurial itch within the company. So the entrepreneur, I like to say, came out yes. in you. And a lot of people have that these days, but there's so many standards and I can't do this. I'm not allowed to do it. How did you get around at a time? Did you just, did you have to ask permission or you just say, all right, I'm going to knock this out and see what happens. I got in a little bit of trouble for it in the beginning. Um, so when I actually went to the store, um, they had given me a, um, a pager and I didn't know what the pager meant. I'd never used that technology before. The owner of the company was at the restaurant. He was paging me because he was with a high ranking politician and he was looking for me. And I just so happened to have left at that time. I mean, there were staff there to go buy the materials that I needed. So I got in some hot water for leaving and not for answer, and not answering his page when he was paging me. Uh, but then in the weeks to follow the revenue that he saw that he was very appreciative. Um, so I learned at that point as well, as far as, it, it, you know, yeah, you need to go out and do things, but you also need to listen and, and be a part of the organization. So I started asking a lot of questions and not to play dumb, but I learned quickly that if I asked for assistance on things, people were happy to share their knowledge. So then I started getting more and more assistance from different people, whether it was the CFO on financials. Um, so I just started asking and the the library of knowledge opened up within their organization. That's amazing. So I love that story because there's so many people that have an idea and they're just afraid to say it or act on it. So it just shows if you hadn't done that, you might still be that bar manager at the airport if you hadn't done that. Correct. And, and there's people that do that and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you do aspire to grow, you need to step out of your comfort zone. You need to think about what do I need to learn? What do I need to do 
to go to that next level. So what is your next step in your journey after you start doing this? You become the regional manager. How long are you with this brand? Seven years uh, with Anton Air Food. And then at one point, uh, Bill Anton sold his organization to a company out of Europe that owns HMS Host. So for the most part, we became the biggest thorn in the side of HMS Host, which is the, the largest vendor in airports around the world. Yep, we huge. were taking business from them left and right. So from good to great, the BHAG that we had was to take contracts away from HMS Host. We won everyone that we bid on, with the exception of Vegas, and that's because a board member of HMS Host also is a board member of the Vegas airport. Um, so we that was our goal. So we were very competitive um as an organization we knew what ebitda was we knew what the company needed to do to grow and survive and of course 9 11 happened and when 9 11 happened i was a regional manager at this point in columbus ohio they we the sky was falling nobody knew what was going to happen so i took over the minnesota airport and the rest of my business so running day-to-day operations of minnesota airport plus my region which stretched out to california wow um so, but it was still to continue. It's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna drive business, we're gonna drive business. And it turned out to be the most lucrative thing at airports because people were getting to the airport now two hours early. They were nervous, so they were drinking more, eating more. Um, so it really turned out well for us. But then the company decided, I should say Bill Anton decided to sell his organization. And you know, he put out a bonus out there for us that. If we hit our EBITDA number as an organization, you hit it as a region, you got X amount of money. So we all were chasing that apple or the carrot. Uh, So what could we do? How could we be efficient, uh, driving revenue, watching costs? And so we all as an organization came together. So it was a great feeling. That's amazing. So how, you know, you mentioned you're covering a huge area of the country and you're regional manager. How are you getting your vision across and making sure people are doing what they're supposed to do in such a big area? What was your way of doing that? So twofold. Um, one was, you know, when I'm at the location, I'm present. Um, I'm not on the phone talking to another community, another property. Um, you know, naturally, computers were slightly different back then, right? You had to sound bang, bang, bang. Um, <laughs> So, which is different, but to be present, work with the individuals in the trenches. I came from the ground up. So that's where my passion is, is working the floor, talking with customers. Um, So, but doing that with them and showing them what that work will get you, the results um, and mentoring as well. And then also having what I had, thankfully with the COO, was this no judgment zone. There's no guilty. It's, you know, we can come to the table express whatever we've done or whatever and there's there's no firing squad so let's whatever it is we just need to get through it together um so just being supportive working together um i think was probably the biggest part of it and you know unfortunately still today i don't have my own internal life balance my brain never shuts down Uh, i don't have a light switch for it so it keeps going Um, so that's one of the good functions when i had properties on the west coast to the east coast I could be awake later at night and be doing work. So you're, you got that all going on, which sounds like you had a, a great team. HMS host comes in and buys. Do you end up staying with them or what do you decide to do when that happens? No. So I just have to be on a flight uh, flying to Boise, Idaho. Um, we're building restaurants in Boise, Idaho at the time. And I've got blueprints out on the plane. And the owner of Thomas Cuisine um, uh, Thad comes up and he says, he says, oh, I see those are restaurant blueprints. He says, I'm impressed you're actually doing work on a plane. I said, oh, you know, we're building restaurants in the airport and I'm landing. So I, I need to be as familiar with it as I can be. And he introduced himself as Thad Thomas, the owner of Thomas Cuisine and said, you know, Lance, you know, I live in Boise. Uh, I am in the hospitality and nursing home business and B&I business. Um, would love to play golf with you whenever you're in Boise. Let me know. And so then, you know, while I was out on my next trip, I looked him up, we played golf together. He says, Lance, I'm gonna be honest with you. I want you to come to work for me. So this was in the course of about a six month period. And so it just so happened that the company had been sold and the offer came on the table to come work for him in another industry. He's like, Lance, not just your work ethic, but I love what the organization that you worked for did. You transitioned to airport dining from the old burgers and more to restaurants, fine dining, casual dining. 
we want to do the same thing in the hospital industry. We want to go away from the tray line. So I would love to have you join us. So I did. So I moved wow. out to Seattle um, and joined him uh, and then transitioned several hospitals over from the tray line to a room service model where the, the patient is in charge. The nurses didn't like it, uh, but they saw the patient satisfaction scores go up. So now if I wake up at eight in the morning, I want breakfast, I order breakfast, I might have rehab at 8.30, they'll reschedule my rehab for nine. Um, so you're not getting back to your room after rehab to cold food. Um, you're not ordering the night in advance or the day in advance. You're ordering off of a menu and based on your diet, the chefs would create that plate for you to match your diet. That's so cool. Um, so I think yes. this is an area of the industry that people don't think about, right? And this is why I was excited to talk to you because you have been in areas of the industry that a lot of people don't think about. Where more else do you need hospitality than in hospitals, right? And in, in the healthcare area, what was it like you for you transitioning from you know the airport and restaurants and more traditional to this? Was it hard to do or was it a natural fit? So I was fortunate I could come in and learn from individuals that were doing it, but I view food as food. Um, so if your concept is to have chefs um, and they had some great chefs with their organization. How do we transition that into the uh, dining rooms of the cafeterias for the, the employees working there? How do we transition that for the, the patients that are going through, whether it's a three-day surgery in and out, or if they're there for a longer period of time? You know, how can we deliver that? And you put yourself in their shoes. Uh, you know, Myself as a young kid, and at this point, I really had never been hurt. Um, so I didn't know from a personal standpoint what it would be like to be in a hospital, but I just viewed that if you went to the hospital, you eat well. Um, so and that's, that wasn't necessarily the case that I learned. Um, but their vision of what they wanted, I was so on board with it. Um, so it's like, okay, let's dress our, our team members up in tuxedos, that are not complete, but vest, dress shirt, pants, and have the room service card. And so I did work in some resorts along the way as well. You know, so this is like room service to at a resort or a hotel when we deliver the food. So we had a flower on the tray. We delivered nice. the food in. So all of that was just like a hotel. So I just kept picturing it. I didn't picture it as healthcare. I pictured it as a hotel. Um, so that took some of the nerve out. Learning the diets was probably the nervous part. You know, if you're a renal patient, you know, certain things can kill you. So you've got to follow those, those recipes, as it says. It's not, well, I think it would go good this way. The diet those are very important but the programming that we had allowed us to know what needed to go where right so if it was a no sugar added a low sodium all the different diets our culinary team were well trained so i didn't have to be the owner of it but i did need to learn it because if i ever had to step into one of their shoes so it was important to learn i love it i think you you nailed that and so as you're in this hospital and you're learning you say all right this is the where i want to stay or did you just kind of start doing what you always do. Stay the best, be the best at it, learn as much as I can. Talk about the journey from a little bit more from there. I did. So the same thing there was I wanted to have be the best. So I hired a chef of one of the big hospitals in Seattle. And the CEO of the hospital, you know, he's like, oh, Lance, you think your boy can make a turduncan? I said, well, he can make anything you want. What do you want? <laughs> and so, you know, he ordered that. So we would do heart balls. We were doing all kinds of things beyond just the patient feeding. So there was all those different avenues that we could have fun with food. You know, we were doing things down in the Puget Sound at somebody's house that was catered. So it was a lot bigger than just the hospital. Uh, the hospital was the most important part, but it was a, I was able to recruit people because I could hire like catering. It wasn't a catering person for a healthcare. It was a catering person that understood catering in a wide scale, whether it be a hotel, a resort, same with the chefs. So understanding what the business was, I could, and then we could all learn the healthcare part together. So if we're going to really make it the best hospital environment, we need to make it the best environment for everybody. So that included the employees, so their break rooms, the doctor's lounges, what that looked like. So, and, you know, and it was a hospital system that wanted to be the best. Awesome. And so as you're doing this, how do you now start transitioning to where you are today? Because you, you told me a little bit about the places you were before your current location. How do you start making that transition more into the retirement community world? 
So I'll fast forward a little bit and, and leave some parts out. So I ended up in Ethiopia. My uh, The mother of my daughter is from Ethiopia. Wow. And so she'd done all that traveling with me. Um, she wanted to uh, build a home in Ethiopia. So I actually left the United States for a year. We went there and built a home outside of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, did a little consulting work while I was there. Um, but while I was gone, I kept in touch with different people within the industries that I knew. And so in speaking with somebody, they said, I know somebody that's looking to have somebody run their airports. So I reached out to them. I interviewed over the phone with them. When I landed back into the country, not having a job, I met with him in New Jersey. He hired me on to be his deputy director of operations to oversee seven airports, predominantly in the Midwest and Northeast. Um, so I went on to do that for a while. And you know he was real keen on ownership. And we both had two different views. And Dean Hashim, a great man, great businessman. You know, he was looking for ownership. And so, and so was I. Um, you know, something I had learned in Anton Air Food, where a few of the people had ownership in the organization. So it was sold. They got paid. They didn't get paid annually. They just got paid if it was sold. So I approached him on the same thing after being with him for a year and actually turning his business from a mom pop into a business where we had P&Ls at each location. Uh, we had key uh, deliverables at each one. So everybody knew whether they were successful or not on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, so it had gotten a lot of things in line, opened up several restaurants for him and approached him and said, Dean, I, I'm taking to heart the ownership. I'd like 3% ownership of the organization. And only if it's sold, I'll get paid 3%. If you never sell it, I never get a penny. Um, so he talked to his wife and came back, says, we're not in the position right now to do that. I said, I get that. You know, but I've got a, a daughter right now that's in kindergarten. I'm on the road six days a week for you. Uh, I need to either make a decision one way or the other of my future. So I made a change to guest services uh, where I had that life balance. I could be the soccer coach uh, for my daughter. Uh, we moved to Northern Virginia where guest services was based. And I ran several of the largest law firms in the world um, and some of the most high end like Hogan Levels and Morgan Lewis in D.C., so I did that for several years um, and was very successful there. The clients loved me um, and they loved what we were doing. And again, very high end. So the client, uh, Rob Johnson, who I reported to of Hogan Levels, you know, he said, Lance, you know, if I smell garlic in this building, I will throw the chef out on his on his butt. You know, it's, this is a law firm, right? 13 story law firm. I don't want any smells going through the building, but I want to taste garlic, but I don't want to smell it. Um, you know, Lance, you deliver great food. Why can't I get a goddamn fucking good tomato? Excuse my language. So we went out and found that tomato. We delivered whatever the client wanted. But then I got a knock on the door from the vice president of hospitality for senior living, condominiums, et cetera, based out of Florida, vice president of human resources. Lance, we've got a client in Naples, Florida. We think you're perfect for it. The person that's in that position now, the client has decided no, we no longer want that individual overseeing. Nothing wrong. That person continued on with guest services. Um, so I flew down, interviewed there in a place called Moorings Park, which is now the number one senior living community or communities. There's three of them in the country. Um, so I flew down. They said, yes, we want you to run our communities. So I did and was there for almost seven years. Um, running those communities, um, seeing the growth of those. And when they coined the phrase, it's copyrighted, simply the best, they truly meant it. Money was no object for them. Everybody has a budget, but still what the residents pay to live there and their communities and the expectation of being simply the best was at our doorfront every day. Um, so within senior living, you're only as good as the last meal served. And it doesn't matter how high end that is. If your filet is flown in from Colorado, from New Zealand, whatever it may be, if your lobster tail is flown in fresh from Maine, it has to be the best. Um, so we needed to have a, a great team of chefs in which to do that. So let's, I, I love that you gave us all of that. And I want to rewind a little bit, especially for the listeners. So give us the 30 second download on what, what does guest services, the company do? Because it seems like they're doing a lot. I thought they were just in retirement communities, but you're working at law firms, you're working in different businesses. What do they do? So, so guest services um, is a contract management company. 
Um, they got their start in 1917 at, during the World War I movement. Wow. Um, the government realized they needed people to feed people on the mall in D.C. that were coming there to make bullets or whatever it was that they were doing to support the World War I movement. So GSI used to be Government Services, Inc. Um, so and started by Ulysses S. Grant III. So then they decided at one point the government no longer wanted to be a part of guest services. And so they created this non, not for profit organization. Um, so here's this company that is managing the National Mall. Uh, Mount Rainier becomes one of theirs. So they're heavily into parks. Uh, they are in the Senate, the White House, the Congress, all these different parts of BNI. Yep. Um, so they are diversified in that way. The thing about that organization and National Geographic, they can't be bought or sold. They can deplete by losing all contracts and have no contracts and therefore have nobody left to employ. Mm -hmm. um, so then they went into the condominium part of it. And then uh, they had one piece of business called the Marbella in Naples, which is a high rise fee simple with a restaurant in it. Kind of senior living, but not. Yep. Um, a person sold their place to move into Moran's Park. And they got to Moran's Park and the food there was being batch cooked. It was Sara Lee's, lasagna, everything held in a warmer and served to these residents. This resident was used to getting food made a la minute from scratch, fine dining, and said, if they have this at the Marbella, why don't you bring in guest services to, to run it? They brought in guest services. They hired them. Um, and then guest services was then there at Moran's Park, largely because a resident knew better and said, hey, I know somebody that can give better. I love it. And so for listeners, if this sounds familiar, it's because we did have Nico Forrest, the CEO of Guest Services. I know services, Nico Inc. very well. Yes. We just had him on a couple of weeks ago. So I just wanted to tie that all together. Um, I think that's really unique that you actually got to work there. And yes create all these amazing things. And a but phenomenal, you, I'll say this for guest services, phenomenal co uh, company. Uh, Gary, uh, Jerry Gabries, uh, the CEO of the company. Um, I know he's stepping aside these days. He, he said something to me that has stayed with me forever. At Hogan Levels, uh, we needed to make a change from the leadership there as the director. And I had somebody ready to take the role. And this person was extremely qualified. He was the chief operating officer of Anton Air Food, who had semi-retired um, and was looking to get back into the, the business. He said, Lance, I've got somebody that's worked for us for over 20 years. Uh, we've decided to walk away from this piece of business that she's been running. And if you could interview her and give her an opportunity, if you think she can do it. I know you've got somebody already, but if you could interview her. So I interviewed her, a great individual, put her in front of the client. She didn't interview well. Um, so the client initially said, no. I said, can you do me a favor? Can you hire her? And if in 90 days, she's not what you think, you know, this is her first interview in 20 years, then we'll, we'll change and we'll go a different route. So the client said, yes, she was there for the next five years, did an amazing job. They loved her. Um, so, but what Mr. Gabriel said was, you know what? This person means something. They've given their life to the company can we not give something back to her? That meant a lot to hear from yep. large companies that they care about the individual. That's amazing. Cause I feel there's a lot of people in hospitality right now who may not feel that way, right? Especially during the layoffs that happened a couple of years ago and things like that. So it's great to hear that style of leadership. Yes. So that, that's a great story to share. So you are working at the best of the best retirement community in Moorings park. You gave me some amazing stories of just like, you know, it really stuck with me what you told me. Like you have the titans of industry, the most powerful people in the world, and now they can't even take care of themselves. So we're here to really show them a great end to life. That yes. has, has stuck with me uh, since we met uh, like two weeks ago. Um, it really changed the way I look at a lot of things, actually. So I appreciate you sharing that because it just shows, you know, we're all going to be there at some point. Um, but one way or the there, other. One way or the other, we're going to get there. But you're there now, and you were teaching me things that I had never even thought about, how to, how to serve different generations and what that means to each different generation. Can you just touch on that before we continue on the journey? Because I think what you mentioned to me just sitting at that table while we were having lunch opened my eyes to things. Is how are you training people 
and that are starting out in this industry. Sure. So the generational differences that you touched on, Steve, um, and, and they're they're more rapid, right? As as we have the the Gen Z, X, Y, Z, and it's happening faster and faster and faster. These generational changes. But when we think back to the the generation that's probably on the one the one that's almost out now is the silent generation. So, but it's important no matter what business that we're in that we understand who our client is or who our customer is, so that we can re relate and deliver to them. So when you think about the silent generation, they were happy to have three meals. They didn't want to waste anything. So portion size. Uh, so with them, it was just about being happy to have a, a meal at the table. The baby boomers, on the other hand, they're completely different. So we can't take the same approach. Baby boomers are about what I want and when I want it and I want it now. So before it might have been OK just to have a bourbon. Now I want a called out named bourbon at the bar. Well, what do you mean you can't get it? I can get it at the store. Why can't you get it? So we've got that different kind of mentality that's coming in. And then, of course, depending on where you're raised, you, you may not fall into either one of those because we have people international that are relevant to either one of those. And they're accustomed to eating a certain way or dining a certain way. Um, and then when you think about, you know, over the last 20 years, maybe it's changed a lot more. But for a lot, they didn't commute very far. Right. So it's a 20 minute commute. A lot of times it was a the male worked and, and the stay at home mom. So he would get home and dinner was ready. He got his recliner chair, his, his TV dinner table out. They had whatever show on and they ate together or if they had a family, you know, they ate around the table. But dinner was ready when dad got home. So now these individuals that are used to eating at 530 every night. Now, in this world, we're telling them, well, no, you need to make a reservation. Well, what do you need? I need to make a reservation. I've eaten at this time my whole life. Well, yeah, but you all come at 530 and you all want your food now and the kitchen can only handle so much. So it's some retraining of our of our residents. So taking into account all of that and then now taking these servers that are coming off the street typically with no experience. So within the senior living industry, it's a non-tipped industry. So our servers typically start out, depending on the community, we'll say $16 an hour which is a competitive wage these days for Wawa, Walgreens, uh, Kmart, whatever. I don't think Kmart exists anymore, Walmart. Uh, so that that's we're getting fresh clay, which is great. And so we, we hire on the hospitality quotation derived from Danny Meyer. We look for the people that have that 51% and we'll train them. But we're realizing we're training people that have got no experience and more than likely have not dined out at fine dining restaurants. So we go through the basics with them in a classroom training um, and we teach them all about, again, who their resident is. So don't take it personally if a resident's in a bad mood. Um, so as you touched on uh, as well, you know, maybe before I was the CEO and I was running a company of 5,000 people. Now I can't manage my own bowel movements. You know, that, that's big. Or maybe I was a, an athlete in high school or college or even professional. Now I'm on a walker and a wheelchair. Right. So. The anxiety or what goes through my mind is different, right? Before I thought I would live to be 100 and be strong and my memory's not there. I'm slipping in different areas. Um, so as we all age differently, you know, some of us will lose our hair. Some of us, our vision, our hearing, right? Our physical ability, our memory. So all of those things happen. So it's good to let our, our team members know that so that they they don't feel like they're just angry at them. Don't take it personally. Um, the other one is that the last thing to leave are their taste buds and, or not the last, their taste buds go, but the <laughs> this last is stuck one with they me. keep yeah. Yes, this is, stuck is with the me. sweet. Yeah. So if you've ever noticed grandma and grandpa or uh, Joe Biden on TV yeah, these days with his ice cream, yeah. um, it takes them back. It gives them good memories. Um, so they love the sweet because they can taste it. So, and, and then, again, they're on medications. So medications alter their taste as well. So they may say, this doesn't taste good today. Tomorrow it tastes great. And you're like, it's the same soup. Um, yeah. So it's, it's understanding that. So really getting these individuals to understand it. And then again, to take a piece from Danny Meyer is to be the favorite. Danny Meyer's restaurant in New York is, is voted number one most favorite year after year. And I share with our servers, our hosts, our busters, I want the residents to say that you're their favorite. 
So by getting that feedback and sharing it with them, uh, the employees get this sense of belonging that it matters what they do. So they love seeing the smiles, hearing the feedback. We do stand up every day now, or, and we did even before, but with the reservations, we know that uh, we'll say Danny Meyer, even though he's not here, is coming to dinner. What does he like? Oh, that's right. He likes this and this. So what are we going to do? So we have those kinds of stand-ups now. So always my goal has been, and, and it was the same at Morin's Park and as, as here at John Knox Village, is that our servers at one day wait on me down the street making a lot of money. So if you apply yourself, you can learn these things. And it's happened to me numerous times where somebody that was waiting on me at Morin's Park or for me then was waiting on me at a restaurant in Naples. Um, and the same thing with our cooks. We want to do the same program. We want to create an environment where you can learn from us and then move through the industry. Senior living or healthcare has always had a stigmatism. It's just nursing home food. It's, it's mashed potatoes and gravy. It's not, um, you know, for what we do, you know, we've got filet, salmon, you know, wild caught, uh, tuna, sushi. We're doing all kinds of fun things with food, um, seaside scallops, um, so we've got cooks that are now actually culinarians. They're not just putting out food. Uh, we've got servers now that are having a great time delivering it and hearing back from the residents uh, how good they are being. So I'm hopeful that this class of servers will soon be out on the street waiting tables. I love it. I love the enthusiasm you have for it. And, you know, I wanted to, to mention because if you're Driving, don't do this now, but if you aren't, just pause and take a look at John Knox Village and what Lance and also former podcast guest Chef Frederick Delaire are doing. And if you remember, Chef Frederick was the chef at Lowe's Miami Beach Hotel, also worked in Michelin restaurants. So you see the kind of talent they're bringing here. But take a look at what they're creating. I just did a walkthrough of their brand new food hall, theater, speaking room, entertainment room. They have a pool deck that looks like it belongs at a five-star hotel bocce ball courts, you know, uh, pickleball courts, multiple restaurants across the property. So Lance and his team are doing big things. Um, it made me excited to get older and say, all right, this is <laughs> maybe where I got to be. Um, but Lance, you, like, you could work in any five-star hotel. I've sat with you and you have the knowledge to do it. What do you tell people when they say, all right, I'm thinking about maybe leaving the traditional luxury hotel world or Michelin restaurant, how do you can talk to them about coming to what you're doing now? Sure. So I'll use uh, Chef Frederick. Um, okay. So when I first landed here in Pompano Beach, uh, my first step was to find a high caliber chef. Uh, and he had actually applied. I had his resume and I was like, oh, wow, this I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he knows where he applied. Even though our, our objective is to get ACF accredited chefs. But for those of you that know Frederick Delaire and his career path, um, it, it's, it's simply amazing. So one of the things that I share with people is a life balance. One, we're all about great food and great hospitality. We want to be the best. We want to compete with resorts and country clubs from a, a staffing perspective. Um, and we are looking at ways in which to recruit. Um, so when Chef Frederick came, I gave him a tour of the community. He didn't realize what was behind the four walls, if you will, or behind the curtain or behind the palm trees that go around the community um, or what senior living was. Um, and he found all of these restaurants, again, resort style pool with a bar and a restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. And for him, it's like this is like a resort driving around the community. There's high rise towers, villas. And seeing the dining rooms that are formally set. Um, so I shared with him, I said, this is real. Um, and of course, on his first day, I told him at 4.30, go ahead and go home. Your day's done. And he couldn't <laughs> believe me. He's like, what? That was the last day. Um, he then told me, no, I'm going to work till seven. So, uh, so now, you know, so life balance, you know, so our dining rooms close at eight. Uh, we drop our New Year's ball at 9.30. There are residents that want to go and watch the ball drop at midnight and they'll go to a hotel or someplace for that. Uh, but it's really important within our communities, the life balance for our team members. So all of our restaurants close at eight o'clock at night. Um, so our cooks are out at a decent hour. So our servers are at, our managers are at a good hour. Um, so that's really one of the parts of it is the life balance. But also, though, we still are doing things that are that we are being cutting edge on. 
I want to be ahead. We're doing sous vide. We, we're doing things that other restaurants on the street aren't doing. You know, we'll have wine dinners um, for 20 people and we'll do a five course meal. So those things happen in these communities. Um, so and they don't happen in all of them, but they are starting to happen more and more, largely to do with the baby boomer that's coming in. They are used to traveling, going out to eat um, and going to wine dinners. You know, their expectation is higher. So they're elevating the, the bar with us as well. I love what you're doing there. It really wasn't very impressive. I didn't know what to expect when I came through. I was like, all right, let me go see what's going on. They wanted to order some Biscayne coffee for their brand new coffee shop. I was like, all right, let me see what's going on here. I thought it'd be like a little hole in the wall. And it looks like a world-class setup. Uh, so I'm impressed with what you're doing. Now, we could keep talking. We've we've already gone 45 minutes. It flies by, doesn't it, Lance? This flies by yes, it talking about your career. Talking about things you're passionate about, you don't even realize time. I know. And so, you know, I want you to share, what are you most excited about? Not in the next five years, but like say in the next 12 months, what's most exciting to you of what's coming up? So this community, one of our big projects that we've got out in front of us is we want to really drive the business around the pool. We've got two luxurious pools uh, that sit side by side like a resort. Um, so we are wanting to utilize that pool more. So we're looking at QR code ordering from the chair. So just like you're at a resort, you order and the pina colada is brought to your chair, your grouper sandwich is brought to your chair or whatever it is that you order. Uh, so we've got that on our radar to, to land over the next year um, and then to continue to brand and rebrand. So we've got uh, several restaurants on property that we have in the process of truly branding as destination restaurants. So it's to really see that come to fruition um, and then also to start up a culinary training program similar to the ACF where we'll put you through a program again to where you'll learn butchery, your knife skills, um, to be able to track culinarians as well. Um, and then we're also in the process right now of starting uh, the training program 2.0, uh, which is on wine and wine pairings, uh, liquors. So to really continue that elevation of the training of our front of the house staff. So I'm just excited to see where we're at in a year from now. And again, you know, the neat thing about senior living, though, is a year from now, the bar where it's at, there's no going back. Uh, it's still what's next. So there's always going to be something coming around the corner that we've got to elevate to. You know, we just had somebody walk through our door this weekend looking for us to cater for 300 on property. Um, so we get those kinds of things. So it's, you know. With Chef Frederick being on board, we've got great menus uh, that are featuring fresh product. Um, we've got a great catering menu. Um, you know, it's just continuing to elevate that bar and what can we add to our arsenal again? Because we don't want to just be the best in this area. We want to be the best in South Florida and then the best in Florida. And at one point, compete against Moorings Park to be the best in the country. I love that goal. I think that it's something that's definitely doable with the team that you're putting together. So, Lance, if you were starting out today, young 15-year-old Lance is coming and joining your team, John Knox Village. What advice do you have for him starting out in hospitality? Be a sponge. Uh, go to work. Be on time naturally. Uh, be professional. Have fun. Uh, I can't preach it enough to our team members. Come to work and have fun, but get your job done. So listen to those that have been before you uh, and take away what you can. Now, granted, we've got a lot to learn from everyone, right? Whether they're 15, they're 20, they're 30, they're 50, they're 80. Everyone has knowledge that we can learn from. So again, if you're a, a manager out there as well, though, listen to your new team members coming in. Um, knowledge is power and where you get it could be from around the corner, it could be right in front of you. But for the new person coming in, be a sponge, try to work all the different positions. Ask if you can work back of the house, front of the house, in order to find out really what seat on the bus is the best made for you. It might be the driver, right? So where are you going to get that knowledge? Be the sponge at work. Learn, watch other things. You know, learn from your mistakes, but also be daring enough to try something to where you might make a mistake. I think it's a great advice and a good place to end our conversation. Lance, I'm very grateful you spent this time with us. I know how busy you are. And uh, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way to do it? So via my personal email, sansonlance at AOL.com. Unfortunately, my LinkedIn account got hacked recently, so that's uh -oh. not one anymore. 
Um, and then, of course, on Facebook, it's Lance Sanson. There's two accounts out there. One of those got hacked as well. Um, the one with the uh, the skydiving suit with my daughter. Um, and then also phone number 703-399-9825 or through Steve Turk or if you know Frederick <laughs> DeLayer through Chef. We got it covered here. And listen, for everyone listening, I was really excited to have Lance on here because it, it opened my eyes to a whole different part of the industry that if you're looking to make a change, give a call to Lance because he'll give you all the details on what this part of the community is like. Lance, thank you once again. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for your partnership as well.